Thank you. Um, it was a lovely introduction. I, um, I do this a lot and uh, because we have a civilization that's very concerned about the future, about where we're headed. And I'll talk about some reasons for that um, in a minute. But I often feel a little extra nervous when I'm in my hometown crowd. <laughs> and San Diego has long been my hometown. I had moved down here in the year that this foundation was founded, 1975, and um, <clears throat> grew up in LA. It's, it turns out that I have a very similar story to Anne Dines. Uh, grew up not far from each other, and. Hughes Aircraft Connections and all that sort of thing. And it, it's been very nice to reconnect with Bob and Ann Dines. Um, and what I'd like to talk about this evening is looking forward another 40 years. Now, the reasons why, this is a few of my, my slides are obviously recycled from other speeches, you know, to agencies back east where I talk about what it is that we do when we do anticipation. <clears throat> well, it turns out that we have a couple of organs on our, in our brains that are unlike any that are held by any other creatures. Uh, we, we, have the, we have the same cerebellum and medulla as fish. We have similar uh, mammalian cortex with other mammals we share the primate cortex, which was layered on top of that with, with other primates. But right here, just above the eyes, uh, are the prefrontal lobes. And these are, I relate to a phrase in the Bible describing Moses, and this is Michelangelo's greatest work, uh, his statue of Moses, um, that he had lamps on his brow. Lamps on his brow. Well, people couldn't, didn't know what to make of that, so they, thought it was a slight mistranslation from a similar word, horns. And that's why Moses was always depicted with horns on his head. Um, and and not, not disrespectfully in some cases like this one. Um, but in fact, the lamps on the brow, well, that, that really does speak to what the prefrontal lobes do. Because these are the organs that let us do the thought experiment, the Gedanken experiment, as Einstein called it, which is where you put yourself in a possible future situation and contemplate the consequences of your actions. What, what if I raise this topic at, a me, at the meeting tomorrow? What if I wear this today? What, what if I try to run this yellow light? And we're constantly going through life going, nah, no, 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 I'm not gonna do that. No, 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 no. Ladies, you have no idea how often we, we, we say, no, I'm not gonna do that. And, but it's also how we spot some of our mistakes. And it's also how we spot some possible opportunities. And also the prefrontal lobes are involved in empathy, imagining what it might be like to be that other person. And, and so that's why I'd much rather have a free bottle in front of me than a prefrontal lobotomy. <laughs> uh -huh. But at best, we, we spot some mistakes to avoid. At worst, we weave satisfying delusions. And these are compensated partly by scientific thinking. Scientists are trained to at least recite the sacred phrase of science, and that is, I might be wrong. And so that helps us to find some of our mistakes. But humans are inherently delusional. So how do we find our, our mistakes? Through reciprocal criticism. And that's why uh, the most best way to become f more free of errors is to get married. <laughs> but many of the things that we do to try to look ahead, auguries, tea leaves, horoscopes, uh, well, they've given way. And now there are many fashions in prediction. Uh, scenario building is one that you see a lot, where um, um, gifted storytellers um, uh, like Peter Schwartz, um, will concoct three or four different possible paths, and then you write a book about it, and, and people choose you know, which, which they, it has some effect upon policy. Games and simulations have been around for a long time, but they're growing in sophistication. 
Recently, uh, in fact, just last week, I was in New York talking to Microsoft and in DC at the MITRE Corporation talking about crowdsourcing and prediction markets. This is where people bet with each other on what they think the future will be like. And this has been a great method for finding people who are anomalously right a lot, which is, I think, a very major step. And then there's science fiction. And this is a form of scenario building. This is, a, this is how we create a vivid scenario about the future, one that has some action, one that has characters, conversation, and maybe even a little bit of sex. Uh, so this is a, uh, a scene portrayed by the great artist uh, Patrick Farley of a, a scene from my latest novel, Existence, where the rich are no longer content with hiring rides aboard Richard Branson's uh, uh, ship, but instead build their own hobby rockets. And I see nothing to prevent this whatsoever. But there are realms of the future, and the first is the near realm. And this is the one that Michael Crichton um, occupied in every one of his stories. And that is, you take the world of today and add one big mistake. And what he never mentions in his novels is that there are always mistakes that would not have happened if the mad scientist had acted like a scientist and not done it in secret. Uh, hey, Jurassic Park dude, um, how about this? Make the herbivores first. <laughs> then you'll only have to pay John Williams for half of his score, the part where they meet herbivores, da da, da da, da da, and not the velociraptor part. <laughs> But I didn't show a Michael Crichton book. Instead, I showed Kevin Costner. Why? Because this is, the, um, this is a Chinese translation of my novel, The Postman, which is better than the movie. <laughs> Actually, the movie was very visually and musically gorgeous, like all Costner films, uh, and big-hearted. Actually, I, I, I appreciate it. It was faithful to the heart of my book. It just scooped out and threw away all the brains. Uh, then there's the far future. And this is a scene from my, um, one of my novels about dolphins in space. Who can beat that? Why don't they make a movie? Um, but the notion um, that if you go beyond 100 years in the future, then you're playing tennis with the net down. You, you can basically hypothesize some human destiny and fabulate how you got there. But the really hard stretch is the 40 or 50 year um, projection. And that's where it, um, you would have to, um, and, 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 I, and I like how you referred to this, if you were to take your younger self from 40 years ago and bring her up to today and show her around, what would be her reaction? She'd spend half the time saying, wow, we never thought of that. And the other half the time saying, you mean you're still doing that? And this mix of, Excitement, fear, and disappointment is what you have to ca uh, capture in your 40-year projections, and that's what I aimed for in my two novels, Existence and Earth. And you can see a three-minute video trailer for Existence, which we're going to be referring to. Now, San Diego in 2055. This, we're talking now, uh, that hard, mid-future. Really difficult. Some people think that we'll all be gods by then. Some of you have heard of the singularity. If you don't know about the singularity, look it up. It's a crazy concept. It might come true. And that is the notion that we're going, the computers are going to take off faster and faster, and that either we will become short of gods, but <laughs> pretty darn amazing, or we'll be left in a cloud of dust by our descendants, the computers. Now, what are San Diego's assets? Well, location, geography. Down in the lower left corner of the United States, I told the donors earlier, that's where everything loose in the continent rolls down. Everything that wants to get things going, do something. Uh, we, we let Silicon Valley happen we, to give them a head start. The, no way. We also have climate and beauty. Um, but also tech and education. And when Peggy, I'm talking to Peggy earlier, one of the questions you can ask is what's the underlying aspect to education that Americans never discuss? But we have this fabulous, fantastic infrastructure 
of higher education here that has resulted in um, us, be, us almost lazily easing our way into being one of the greatest centers of communication and biological science in the world. And diversity in the arts, um, at diversity and the arts rather, um, our ability to create a multicultural center um, that uh, stretches all the way across the border and our ability to negotiate with each other um, looking past all past preconceptions. Now, there are perils and obstacles, and these are more important to look at than the assets, because this is how we use the prefrontal lobes to try to figure out what's going on. Water, huge problem. Energy, infrastructure and transportation. Uh, sprawl versus good planning. Where's our food gonna come from? Uh, border issues and opportunities. How are we going to become a people who can protect the significant ways in which America was an exceptional experiment while continuing the other half of the experiment, and that is widening our horizons of inclusion so that what we define as America and American keeps broadening and broadening. Social and wealth disparities, these are very important. Uh, throughout human history, almost every human civilization was shaped like a pyramid with a few at the top, lording it over others, and therefore making huge mistakes. Because as I said, criticism is the only antidote to error, and when you're a king or a lord, you don't get the criticism you need, and I just explained human history to you. <laughs> Three sentences. You don't need anything more than that. When you have a society that's shaped like this, it's going to make calamitous errors. And when you have the kinds of tools we have, nuclear weapons, biological, and all of that, we simply can't go back to this. So what is ours? Ours is diamond-shaped. At least in the ideal, at least the ideal, the notion that we have a vast and empowered middle class that is unafraid of the rich and that outnumbers the poor. In other words, we got them surrounded. And we can do something about it. And it's socially mobile. Who your parents were does not automatically define what you're going to be. It's a totally different kind of society. Climate change. Well, you all look so intelligent that I really don't have to go there. Just look at what's happening around the world. Dilemmas of freedom, and of course the constant worry that science fiction is grist for science fiction of calamities, social calamities, uh, uh, terrestrial accidental calamities, Rocks falling from the sky. I studied these when I was a PhD student here at, at, at UCSD, but also calamities of our own making. So what kinds of solutions do we see on the horizon? Well, San Diego is the leader in desalinization. And we are hopeful that new technologies will come along that will make the Encinas power plant uh, the biggest desalinization in the Western Hemisphere seem like a terrible mistake because um, new technologies come along that are far cheaper. May we have such problems. May we have such problems. Innovative transport. Um, I just spoke with Elon Musk the other day. He was, he's, he's uh, our, our, our generation's Edison trying to come up with new approaches to transport. What's going to happen when you're going to be able to summon your car that went off and parked itself when it dropped you off? Or better, better yet, it's not your car. It's, part, it's, it's owned by your club. And you happen to have reserved using it today. And it says, where do you want to go? And you say, home, James. Food that is both local and urban. This is a picture of some of the um, production facilities growing lettuce in Japan as we speak that have far higher production rates than, than the farms uh, that we buy our produce from um, across the world. And the question is, will our buildings in the future, our tall buildings, all their south side exposures be taken up by farms? You wind up using 1% as much water as the, uh, as the typical land-based farms. And of course, our innovation, our ability to innovate. And this is typified by the maker movement, which has several facilities here in San Diego and is enthralling our kids. 
I was a volunteer in high school for my sons when they were in the first robotics team. And this is something worth supporting, Dean Kamen's Robotics League, that on many campuses is as popular as the football team and as fashionable. Who would have thought geeks striding through the halls? Hey, robotics guy. <laughs> but the maker movement is setting up these centers that, that help people to create better glasses. <laughs> <laughs> that help people to create new ways of, of innovating outside like with 3D printing, which is no longer a joke because you can make, now make rocket engines jet engines out of 3D printing. And we did some pioneering work at Cal Space, California Space Institute here. Um, uh, Mr. Gross, are you here? There you are, work with him at Cal Space. And the, um, but also the question of calamities. Are we prepared? Because I spoke of anticipation on these prefrontal lobes. Well, that's half of the ingredients. You can only anticipate some problems and then you make mistakes and bad things happen, like happened on 9-11, the day that all of our professional anticipators and protectors failed in everything they did that day. But what worked that day? The other thing, resilience. Resilience of a highly adaptable citizenry. And New Yorkers took charge that day. And of course, the Bostonians aboard that, the great heroic flight, UA-93, who rebelled and won the war that day. Well, there's a way that you can get involved in this, uh, and that's CERT, Community Emergency Response Team. The fire department, your local fire department, probably has a training program for CERT, and it's all that's left of civil defense in our, in our nation. And this helps to develop resilience. Qualcomm, here in town, has developed a system by which if the cell phone towers go down in an emergency, you can, um, you'll be able to pass text messages phone to phone to phone, peer to peer, until they reach a, a functioning cell tower and can enter the system. A fantastically important element of national resilience that the cell phone companies refuse to set in motion. There was a woman at, uh, in, in the Fukushima disaster who, uh, when they found, finally dug her out from the rubble a month later, they found all sorts of outgoing texts calling for help in her phone. People had been walking by, people had been driving by, but the cell towers had been down. So resilience is the other thing that we have to have in our planning for the future of San Diego. And then there's the question of society. This is my nonfiction book, The Transparent Society, about the whole notion of how we can create a civilization in which we need government less, not by hating government. Government is our shared project. And our, grand, and our parents and grandparents in the greatest generation who fought World War II and fought the Depression and, and, and contained communism, they would, they would laugh in disdain at this whole anti-government thing. No, you make government wither away by making it unnecessary, by finding the tools of holding each other accountable. And we're seeing this in the new system whereby people are doing their own video footage of anything they see that's amiss on the street, including bad cop behavior or good cop behavior. And these are all parts of the solutions. Where are we heading? Well, you know, um, William Fulton, the San Diego planning director, spoke recently. Actually, he did an article in the Union the other day about, a global, about urban villages, about how we can liven up our city and have less ex uh, infrastructure need if we can get a little bit of densification in our suburbia so there are jobs where the people are. But I take the meaning of village considerably farther. Right now, you walk in, go anywhere on the planet, yes, by transportation, but you have to carry around these. These are prosthetics for reputation. Our ancestors knew maybe 5,000 people in their lives, and they would be trusted in their local village. They could do a deal by a handshake. In the future, you're going to wander around the world with eyeglasses that will check people's faces and, and write name tags on them. You'll never be at a loss. For, for the name of the person. You click your tooth, you grunt a little instruction, and it'll scroll down, and, and there'll be three sentences of their profile, or three sentences that you said, remember next time you meet this person in 20 years. You say, well, whatever happened to that dog of yours, you know, as if you remembered. 
or several sentences of dissenting opinions from his ex-spouse. <laughs> Up to you. As you can see in this depiction from uh, my novel Existence, people are out on the street and they are, and that's San Diego, as you can see. The scene, the scene set in San Diego, if you wanna, uh, you can read, um, I do a reading of this scene. Uh, if you go to my website, I have the site at the end of the talk. And it talks about how when we are so equipped with these powers of vision, she, these, these little, little antennae um, that she's wearing can turn and give her vision behind herself or look ab above from the height of a very tall person. Um, the amount of information that you'll have, uh, the augmented reality, these are going to be challenges to our wisdom but there are also going to be ways that we can expand the capabilities. Now, do problems get solved? I'll race through this. This is a fellow named Daniel Pinker, and he has a book called The Better Angels of Our Nature that points out all the reasons for good news, how democracy has been rising ever since 1946, how um, the crime rates have been plummeting, how uh, armed conflicts around the world, you wouldn't think it from the news, but the critical attention that the news brings to those armed conflicts that are going on right now, to places that have poverty, has been part of the reason why we have been adjusting our behavior um, and per capita rates have gone down. The evolution of poverty, you can see it plummeting there on the left in China and in other places as well. And so the question then becomes, why? Do we not pat ourselves on the back over the expansion of the horizons of inclusion that has been going on? Well, the reason is because we're never satisfied, and we shouldn't be. Whatever level we've achieved is barely enough to survive, barely enough to get the, through the challenges of our, de, of our era and to give our kids a chance. Therefore, we have to keep up the pressure to keep all these things improving, but many have improved. Who would have thought 40 years ago, that there would still be whales on this planet. All of them. Now, the great collapse could come tomorrow. It could come next month. It could come next year. We have to keep up the efforts. But it's not a hopeless situation. Even this, even the warming of the planet, there are things on the horizon being built, being developed at a rapid point, a pace that might be game changers and that might change the game in spectacular ways, enabling us to mine asteroids, for example, and get so much wealth that we could turn the Earth into a park. This is being done now. Investigators who are billionaires are putting a little fingernails, you know, 1% of their wealth into projects like this, supported in this case by the Obama administration. But there will be more challenges to us. We're starting to meddle in the recipe of life. So what's going to happen? Are we going to make designer babies? Are we going to have limitations on this? The question is, can any law actually prevent it? Do you honestly think you won't see um, woolly mammoths in the next 15, 20 years? <laughs> Where are you hiding? We are, do you honestly think you won't see Neanderthals, as I portray in, in my novel existence, within the next 30 years? Or chickens that have been made to be like dinosaurs? These are all happening. You're not going to prevent it. But what we can do, instead of standing athwart history with our arms out saying, stop, who can tell me who said that? William F. Buckley. The tsunami of change that's coming at us, that's dealt with in the literature of change called science fiction. This tsunami can be dealt with better by a people who learn to surf than standing like Kanut and saying, stop. This is an old question, actually. It goes back to the Bible. Again, I've gone full circle back to the Bible, which is a strange thing for an astrophysicist, a science fiction author to do. I have a riff on this um, in my, on my YouTube channel, which I really shocked some of the singularity guys. Because some of the, some of the memes and mythoses in the Bible, I think have been misinterpreted. God wasn't angry. You read the
read the story of the Tower of Babel, there's not a word of anger. In fact, he says, if they continue, nothing will be beyond them. In other words, inherently, nothing is beyond us. All right, so he said, scatter, scatter, go, go, go get jobs, go, go have a lot of experience, gain diversity. But it's not stopping us now. You can translate any language. Our tower is wide, it's very tall. And it's gonna take a lot more than language problems to stop us now. And maybe nothing is beyond us now. And maybe we will become a wide variety of geniuses or citizens, or people. So anyway, these are some of the things we talk about at the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, recently started at UCSD. I urge you to look it up, get on the mailing list. Um, loads of fun stuff. We, um, uh, Richard Dreyfus and I sat on, uh, on a table like this and, and discussed uh, Close Encounters just before a screening a little while ago. And Kier DeLay, um, Dave from 2001, also we did that. So there are a lot of cool activities at the Clark Center. And it's an example of why this is one of the most spectacular and imaginative places in the world and why I believe we can cope with all of the things that we discussed. Thank you. <laughs>